on the 14th of January this year, the people who just lost their friends a week before and survived the terrible attack on Charlie Hebdo published a new issue of their magazine. And it had the title, All is Forgiven. I was terrified in that week. Um, I was shattered because I felt that it, I was personally attacked, or would I believe, all my values were attacked. So when I saw this there, I thought, wow, these people are transformation agents. One week after, they can give their hand. Soon after, we started to talk about this year's Berlin Change Days, and I talked to Eugenio, who will be our facilitator of the learning journey, and I said, Eugenio, um, this has an impact on the Berlin Change Days. And Eugenio said, so then, let's make it the topic. How do we, who want to be the change, deal with people who have a very, very different view on what change means. So this is our topic, from change to transformation. And let me talk a little bit about what that means. And let me talk in particularly about who we are, we as a group here. Over the year, I thought a little bit about who are we, who are we as whatever we call ourselves in change, whether we call ourselves lovers or consultants or teachers or parents or transformation agents or change management specialists. Who are we? And I would like to offer you four metaphors which work well for me and you have to see whether they work for you. So. First of all, of course, we are craftspeople, craftsmen and craftswomen. We all have our tools, our toolboxes, which we constantly fill. We go to trainings, we go to Berlin Change Days to sharpen our souls. And we are very good at that. We are very good at using our tools. That's what defines many of us. We are really good at, we go somewhere, we have a process, we fix things, or we help clients to fix things. And while doing s research for the Berlin Change Day's keynote, I, I found some interesting article in the Los Angeles Times from 1991. It was about uh, some archaeologists and the paradigm shift that happened at that time because they made some new discoveries in Egypt. So what they wrote, Egyptologist Zahi Hawass has spent years sifting clues left by the pharaonic working class. There are discarded tools and graffiti praising the prowess of ancient constructing teams with su such names as Vigorous Gang, Enduring Gang, North Gang and South Gang. Slaves build things because they are forced to, but they could never build the pyramids, said Hawass antiques director for the pyramids and the Sphinx. These were built with genius, a genius impossible for slave labor. Which gang do you belong to? And how do you utilize your genius and your tools to bring change to the world? And ask yourself, where do you, where do you stop, where you hesitate, because you feel that all the good tools you have are not enough to bring change. <coughs> if crafts people is good but not enough, what other roles do we have? The next role I choose is the snake charmer. Because sometimes we really charm the snakes we work with isn't it? And I mean that in a positive sense. I mean that in the sense we really want to get people in. I mean, we want to draw people in. So we use all our charm to draw people into our field. Which are the dangerous creatures you, you work with? And do you 
remove their venom plants or do you face the poisonous beast? How do you charm and how do you use that to bring change into the world? Charming and tools sometimes are not enough. So we need to slip into other roles. And the next metaphor I want to offer to you is the metaphor of the court jester. He looks a li little bit tired, and probably you all know that. But we all know that sometimes our kids or our lovers or our clients ask us to be the court jester, to say, to say the truth they cannot speak out in their organization. And we do that, yeah. We, we take courage. We take courage to point on things which need to be said in organizations. And sometimes we make a little fool of ourselves. And I want to read a little line of a book on fools are everywhere, the court jester around the world. It is in the nature of jester to speak their minds when the mood takes them, regardless of the consequences. They are neither calculating nor circumspect, and they may account for the foolishness often ascribed to them. Jesters are also generally of inferior social and political status, and they are rarely in a position to pose a power threat. They have little to gain by caution and little to lose by candor, apart from liberty, livelihood, and occasionally even life. They are peripheral to the game of politics, and this can reassure a king that their words are unlikely to be geared to their own advancement. Jesters are not noted for flattery or fawning. The ruler can be isolated from his courtiers and ministers who might conspire against him. The jester, too, can be an isolated and peripheral figure, somehow detached from the intrigues of the court, and this enables him to act as a kind of confidant. So, my questions to you, dear court jesters, is what kind of foolishness do you display to really get the truth out in the systems you work? How often do you shed light on the dark sides in those systems? And how often do you just act crazy? And there's my fourth metaphor to you. Sometimes in rare occasions, we are sorcerers or healers even. We help systems to transform and to transcend, or people to transform and to transcend. And these are this very moment where I, for myself, realize what I'm doing and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, these are moments where people come up to me and say, huh, that made an impact on me. Yes, we can be sorcerers. We can be healers. How do you use this immense power? Is it black magic? Is it white magic? What do you use? Do you feel the responsibility of that? Why are we here? I know why, I, why I'm here. I want to make a change in myself, in the people around me, in the world. And we know in this year, there is a lot of things we all want to change. Of course, we want to change things. We see all the tragedies of the world, and we don't know what to do. But we feel, hmm, we have a role to play in that. And we have a responsibility. I defined my mission a year or two years ago. One of my missions is, and I said, I want that people come home from work and they don't start to beat up their spouses or their kids or their family because they had a shitty day at work and they had a bad boss or bad colleagues or other things. 
So, so I'm trying to help people to get into good relationships at work. I'm trying to help people to be leaders who respect and help people to grow. So what's your mission? Let's find out over the next two days. And let's see, let's see what we can do, what things we can do if we cannot fight directly the big problems the world has. We still have the responsibility where we work, wherever, whether we work with companies or with organizations. We don't do the work, I assume. Most people I met, we don't do the work because we want to increase the profit of companies. Don't get me right or wrong. I'm, I'm absolutely happy with helping companies to increase their profit if they are doing good things. That's not why I'm there. <coughs> I'm there for other reasons. So there are a couple of things we can do. We can, we can help building good relationships. And I'm, I'm tempted to do a test here with change facilitators, uh, what's their divor divorce rate is among change facilitators, whether it's over the average or below, but let's, let's leave that here. I mean, okay, I mean, are we good relation people or better than others? Not quite sure, but we are trying. So help to build relationships. Friendship, friendship and fandom. Enjoy nature and make sure that, that nature can, can give us and can provide us what it can. Support good leadership and community. Joy and love. What's the ultimate change model? And I did some very, very deep research and I came up with, you won't know them, four distinguished psychologists or were they are family therapists or something like that. You know what? They developed the ultimate change model already 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Is love. <laughs> How can love be a change model? Most of you, meanwhile, might have heard of Brené Brown. So she says, when we practice generating compassion, we can experience our fear of pain. Compassion practice is daring. It involves learning to relax and allow ourselves to move gently towards what scares us. In cultivating compassion, we draw from the wholeness of our experience, our suffering, our empathy, as well as our cruelty and terror. It has to be this way. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a relationship between equals. Only when we know our darkness as well, we can be present with the darkness of others. Compassion become real, becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity. My dear craftspeople, snake charmers, magicians and court jesters, what are you going to do and enjoy?